During the period of the air raids, we used to go and take shelter in the Spitalfields Market. There were some big basements there. The one that we used to use pre-war had been used for ripening green bananas. We spent many, many nights taking shelter. Our, we were fortunate our flat wasn't bombed, although all around us was devastation. Every night we used to spend in the air raid shelters. One of the family members would go early with some of the blankets to claim a space. We slept with our clothes on in the three-tier bunk beds. I still remember that very clearly and I remember the smell of the canteen. I think it was sold some kind of soup and I can still remember and it was an awful smell. We survived the air raids okay. The only problem was we came home with bed bugs in our bedding which we just couldn't get rid of. It was a terrible problem getting rid of those things. This was the days before DDT and bed bugs are horrible. We survived it but it was very unpleasant. Many people who were not as fortunate as us to live close to a deep shelter used to take shelter in the tube stations or the metro and they would sleep on the platforms often while the trains were still running. First part of the war there were no bunks, people just slept on the platform. Later on the authorities provided places for them to sleep but it was very uncomfortable. My father in his younger days had been trained as a coppersmith but during the depression he was not able to find work as a coppersmith so he learned to become a tailor's presser in the ladies garment trade. There was a lot of ladies tailoring being done in the East End and he worked in those factories for many years. They really were sweatshops. It was a very hard physical demanding job that my father did. What they used to press clothes with was an iron. It was made out of cast iron and it weighed 14 pounds and they would have four or five of them on a gas jet. They would pick them up with a pad and use a wet cloth, put it on the clothes and bang down these irons on the clothes to iron them. He did that all day long and that's the reason I'm sure when he came home he was really dragging, he was exhausted. Late, in later years, for a few years, I worked in the clothing industry and I saw how hard these presses had to work. It was not an easy way to make, make a living. My parents lived pretty much week to week and I know they had a hard life. And during the depression, when my dad was out of work, they had to go and get food from the soup kitchen. There was a soup kitchen for the Jewish poor immediately across the street from our flats. It's still there. At least the building is. I believe now it's a condo. But that building is still there and it still says soup kitchens for the Jewish poor on the outside of it. Today, here in America, everybody knows about bagels. You can buy bagels in dozens of different flavors. At that time, we didn't have bagels, but we did have bagels. Same thing, but much smaller. You could have any flavor you want as long as it was plain. We always got plain bagels. And that's that was all there was. For us, the war began in 1939. In 1941, my brother Toby enlisted in the Royal Air Force, and he was in the Air Force until after the war was over. I think he got demobilized in 1945 sometime and came home. Norman went into the British Merchant Navy. I think he lied about his age and went in when he was 17. He said he was 18. And he was in the Merchant Navy until also, I think 1945. Now, when both my brothers came home, there really wasn't room for six of us in a two-bedroom flat, so we were able to move to a place in another area a few miles away called Hackney, which was a much better place. During the war, since my father was too old to go into the army because he had served in World War I, he served in the civil defense in what was called light rescue. I think what they had to do was help people who had been bombed to... to pull them out of the, of the bomb buildings. There was a tremendous amount of houses destroyed in London during the war. And there were, everywhere you looked, there were what were called bombed sites, which were just flat. And so the people wouldn't fall into these, the basements of these houses, four foot high brick walls were built around the debris. And that must have provided plenty of work for all the bricklayers in London. My parents were not particularly religious. They had been brought up religious, but they didn't keep up with it. Although my mother did keep kosher, and she lit candles every Friday night, and she kept separate plates and silverware for meat and milk dishes. Most Fridays, 
my mother would go to the market and buy a kosher chicken. She would bring home the chickens, pluck the chickens, singe the feathers with a, with a flame, which really made the house stink, and cut open the chicken, take out its insides and cut it up. I couldn't stand that. Couldn't stand the smell of the burning feathers or of the chicken being cut open, so I used to leave the room when she was doing that. My mother used to make all kinds of ethnic Jewish food. For example, she made gefilte fish, which is chopped. Gefilte means chopped. It consists of pike, white fish, and carp. It's all chopped up and mixed up, and is cooked in a fish broth. It's usually eaten cold, with plenty of horseradish. I think that my mother used to want us, the rest of the family, to have the choice of bits of the chicken, so she used to content herself with eating the chicken's feet, and the neck, and the pipic. The, the pipic in English is the gizzard. The American Jews don't call it a pipic, they call it a pupic, but it's the same thing. She also made something called a kishka. She took the skin of the chicken's neck, sewed up one end, and stuffed it with matzo meal, other kinds of seasonings, flour, onions, and some chicken fat, and she cooked that in with a soup. And we ate that cold. It's really very good. It doesn't sound like it, but it really is. Mom also pickled onions and cucumbers, and she made a particularly potent cherry wine. She had a big stone crock, and she would put cherries in it and sugar, and just let it ferment. She didn't put any yeast in it. On one occasion, she had it too tightly capped, and it exploded, and sprayed cherries all around the room. Made a mess of the ceiling, I can tell you. My mother also made matzo ball soup, and the matzo balls were particularly good. The matzo balls, unlike those made here in this country, were hard. She baked them somehow. They were about the size, I suppose, of golf balls, small golf balls. But they didn't bounce quite as far. My mother made lots of fried stuff. She made excellent fried fish and chips, of course. Naturally, in England, she had to have chips. She used to use a solid fat, something like Crisco, and she used it over and over again. The solid fat is bad for your arteries. That may be the reason why all of us in the family developed heart disease in later life. At Hanukkah time, she made latkes, which are potato pancakes, which are fried in oil. I used to like those too, but I'm sure they were not good for us. She made her own chicken soup, and she made her own noodles. Those noodles are called lakshin in Yiddish. She made the matzo balls, which were called kanedlach, and she made a lot of chopped stuff. She made chopped herring, which was great. Chopped liver, which she was an excellent baker also. I really did like my mother's cooking. I suppose most people do, but I still think she was an excellent cook. We did not have a phone at that time. First of all, during the wartime and shortly thereafter, phones were very difficult to be had unless you were in business or you were a doctor or you had some need for it. So we never had one. But even if we had been able to get one, the chances are we wouldn't have got one while my dad was alive. I think he was scared of using the phone. Any time a phone call had to be made, and that was very, very infrequently, he would send one of us to the phone box at the end of the block where we would make the call for him. I suspect he may have been afraid of getting electric shock. I, he never said that, but it just that's my suspicion. Shortly after Dad passed away in 1950, we did get a phone. My uh, two brothers and sister got the phone. I guess they were going on dates and they wanted a phone. It was a party line, however. It was about that time that my brother and sister bought our fridge. It was great for Mom because she didn't have to go food shopping every day as she had before. Our milk was delivered every day. Milkman would leave a bottle or two or whatever it was of milk the, at the front door, I suppose we paid once a week. And we had mail delivered twice a day, too. The milkman used to come around with a horse and cart. The cart had rubber tires. Since they came around early in the morning, I suppose the idea was not to make a lot of noise. And they would carry the milk to the, the flats and leave it there. You could often tell where the horse had been because quite often they left a calling cart. All food was rationed during the war except for vegetables. 